The year was 510 BC, and Pleisthenes was now one of the most powerful figures in Athens. He had lived up to the heroic myths he'd been brought up to follow since childhood. But Greek society was changing. The heroic urge that drove Cleisthenes was no longer reserved for the elite. It was now permeating every level of Greek society. This is Olympia in southern Greece. Here, once every four years, men from across the Greek world would gather to compete in a vast contest of athletic skill. This was the ancestor of the modern Olympic Games. The competitions had been founded in 776 BC two centuries before Cleisthenes had even been born. Then they had been an exclusive competition for the wealthiest of the Greeks. But by Cleisthenes' time, the games had evolved to allow anyone to take part. A nobleman could now race against a potter, a king against a fishmonger. The Olympic Games were a chance for any Greeks to display the sort of heroic qualities that uh, the heroes of Homer had displayed. The competitions had their roots and the skills displayed by the mythical heroes. Chariot racing, running, wrestling, boxing. But here there was no real prize just a wreath of olives and fame throughout Greece. A competitor would be surrounded by the largest gathering of Greeks in peace that he would ever experience. Perhaps as many as 40,000 Greeks would gather for the Olympic Games. Greeks would travel hundreds of miles to attend the Olympics. And during the festival, the land surrounding the stadiums would be covered with encampments. But for the Greek man, whatever his origin or class, to win here would be the highlight of his life. You had, uh, briefly, a moment of glory of extreme fame, which was what the competitive culture of the Greeks valued so highly. Here, the Greeks had perhaps found a civilized way to satisfy the heroic ideal. They had built a meritocracy based on skill and ability, where anyone could win. But a world where everyone could seize victory could only make Athens even more unstable. As soon as Cleisthenes gained power, he found that others were conspiring against him. Here, heroism still meant one thing. Seize power whenever and however you can. The only rule is that you get what you can and that you fight. You have to go in there and show that you can win. The most ambitious of those conspiring against Cleisthenes was a man named Isagoras. Isagoras was another Athenian aristocrat. He, too, had been brought up to believe that power was his right. But Isagoras also knew that he could not gain power on his own.
Pythagoras took an unprecedented step. He turned outside Athens for support. He sent a message to the Spartans, Greece's most feared warriors. Pythagoras was an old friend of the Spartans. Rumor had it that he had shared his wife with the Spartan king. The Spartans immediately provided a force of their finest troops to back up Isagoras' bid for power, to help him betray his city. Isagoras really was upping the stakes. He brought in the most powerful state in Greece. It was pretty clear he was going to turn Athens into a subject state to Sparta. With his Spartan force, Isagoras staged a coup, seizing control of Athens. He and his troops would rule from the high point of the city, the stronghold atop the Acropolis. The first targets of the new tyrant were the other aristocrats. Pleisthenes, most of all. Over 700 households were cast out of Athens, including Pleisthenes and his entire family. Pleisthenes would leave his city, living once again under the hand of a despotic dictator. A dictator who now ruled with the support of the most fearsome power in Greece, the Spartans. For Pleisthenes, all his childhood lessons seemed betrayed. <laughs> 